Linda Slayton. Linda Slayton lived in Lakeland, Florida. On the morning of September 4, 1981, Linda's sister, Judy Butler, visited their house for a cup of coffee. However, upon arriving, Judy made a chilling discovery, her sister's lifeless body. She immediately dialed 911 for assistance. Linda was found lying on the bed, with a wire looped around her neck. It was evident that she had been struck and suffocated. When the police arrived at the scene, they faced the difficult task of delivering the heartbreaking news to Linda's two sons. They informed Jeff, who had been sleeping in the living room, to get dressed and step outside. As he emerged from the house, he was confronted by a multitude of police officers, news crews, and his tearful Aunt Judy. It was at that moment that Judy relayed the devastating events that had unfolded. When a law enforcement officer entered the second bedroom of the house and woke up Tim, Linda's other son, Tim was still dressed when the officer entered the room. Tim passed the bedroom of his mother, which had its door closed at the time. As the door was opening, a law enforcement official was leaving the room. Then, when he arrived at the gruesome crime scene, he witnessed all that had taken place. Due to the fact that the screen had been removed from the window, the investigators speculated that Linda's room had been entered through the window. A photograph of a palm tree was also resting on the window ledge of the room. A man whose identity was unknown had his DNA collected from Linda's body as well. Investigators looked into Linda's past to determine whether anyone she knew could have been the one who committed the crime. They had an interview with Linda's ex-husband, Frank Slayton whom she had divorced in 1974. It was well knowledge that Frank was an angry drinker who had previously harmed Linda. The investigation did not turn up any evidence linking him to the offense, despite the investigators' best efforts. They were also interested in Linda's son, Jeff Slayton. Investigators talked to Jeff several times, but they could not find enough evidence to show that he was involved. They also looked into Joe Mills, Tim's 20-year-old high school football coach. After Linda's split, she had trouble making ends meet and could not afford a car. So Mills drove Tim to and from football practice every day. But the cops could not find any link between Mills and the scene of the crime. Sergeant Edgar Pickett of the Lakeland Police Department, who is an expert on DNA, carefully looked at every part of the crime scene. He found Linda's palm print on the window sill, which was kept along with her DNA. After the accident, Jeff and Tim moved in with their grandparents, Clarence and Margaret Harris. They lived in constant fear and did not go outside much, except for Grandpa Harris, who stood guard with a gun while they slept. A few weeks after Linda's funeral, the boys went back to school and decided to focus on football. Tim put a picture of his football team in his room to remind him of what his mother had told him, to keep going and never give up. Jeff and Tim have said in recent years that they still feel sad and terrible about not hearing anything at night and not being able to save their mother. In March 1999, police made a complete DNA profile of the person who killed Linda. They did not have a match, though. In 2001, Detective Brad Grice took on the case. He got DNA samples from several people of interest, including Jeff and Tim, in order to clear them again. Grice told the boys that he would not quit until he knew what happened to their mother. Frank Slayton also gave a sample of his DNA, but none of the samples matched the DNA found at the crime scene. In September 2001, Detective Grice heard that Jimmy Elmer, who was 24 years old at the time, had tried to hurt a 10-year-old girl by pulling her through a bedroom window and almost killed her. Elmer was found guilty of this, and he got a jail sentence of 80 years. The brutal attack looked very similar to what happened to Linda. Detective Grice also found out that Jimmy Elmer was living with a friend who lived in the same apartment building as Linda when she was killed. Jeff, Tim, and Detective Grice were sure they had found their suspect. Elmer died in prison in 1996, but his mom gave Grice a sample of his DNA. It was a big letdown when his DNA did not match the DNA at the crime scene. It looked like they had come full circle. By 2005, 
Detective Grice was in charge of a new team that looked into cold cases. She asked the FBI to constantly check all government data banks with the DNA profile. But the years went by and there was still no match. Because of health problems, Detective Grice had to quit in 2015. That meant he could not keep his promise. All hope was not lost, though, because in 2018 the cops got excited about new DNA technology. C. C. Moore took on Linda's case because she is a family genealogist. She is a very well-known expert in genetic family research. Moore put the DNA sample on the public ancestry website GED Match. Then, branch by branch, she carefully put together the family tree of the person who did it. She looked at birth records, marriage licenses, obituaries, and social media to find people to add to the family tree. Moore said that she had found three pieces of the perpetrator's family tree, which led her to the most likely person who did it. She said that the three DNA networks came together to make a single family tree that led to one close family. The man was the only kid in that family, so it had to be him. That is what made the DNA stronger. Even though there had been hundreds of leads and dead ends and dozens of options that had been looked into and ruled out, C. Seymour found the man in one weekend. Tim's coach, whose name is Joseph Clinton Mills, drove him to and from exercise. The police wanted to be sure before telling the boys. C. C. Moore's final report from 2019 says that Joseph Mills, who was 58 at the time, lived in Kathleen, Florida, about 30 minutes from where the crime happened. Tammy Hathcock and Russell Hurley were the next Lakeland officers who worked on Linda's case. The cops then looked at the original case files and saw that Mills had been questioned briefly at the beginning. Mills told them that he had brought Tim home and did not know what had happened to Linda. Detectives Hathcock and Hurley still had to compare a new sample of Mills' DNA to the DNA that had been found at the crime scene. This DNA came from a lot of years ago. They sneakily took Mills' trash back to the police station. They found an old piece of medical tape and sent it to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement's crime lab to be tested. Eleven days later, the test results showed that Joseph Mills killed Linda Slayton. Then she could finally tell Jeff and Tim that the monster had been caught. Tim said that he had always liked Coach Joe and that it made him sick that he had kept this picture of him for so long. On December 12, 2019, the cops took Joseph Mills into custody. Here's a picture of Detective Tammy Hathcock explaining the rules to him. He did not cry or ask why he was being taken. He almost looked like he knew why. Sergeant Edgar Pickett is now 94 years old, so Tim and Jeff went to see him after the arrest to thank him in person for getting the handprint all those years ago. At his sentence in 2022, Mills admitted to all the charges against him. People close to Linda wanted to know why Jeff yelled why at him in court. Joe, I'm only curious about why. Why did you take away my mom? I love my mom. Everyone was mad at Mills' statement, which was, I'm a good guy. They are making me out to be someone I'm not. In February 2022, Mills was finally given a life sentence without the chance of parole. C. C. Moore said, We owe a big debt of gratitude to those first crime scene investigators, because at the time this crime was committed, they did not even know DNA would be used in criminal investigations. So it is very important that they collected it and kept it in a safe and responsible way for all these years. We could not have done our jobs if that had not happened. Jeff and Tim say they're determined to move on as best they can and live well for their mom and their families. They are still very close and only live a few miles apart. One of their favorite things to do is fix up old cars. Flora Stevens In 1975, Flora Stevens was living in Sullivan County, New York. She was 36 years old. She worked at the Concord Hotel. On August 3, 1975, she got married to Robert Stevens. Robert took her to the Community General Hospital in Monticello, New York, for a meeting with a doctor. When Robert came back to get her, she was gone. He said she was lost when he couldn't find her. 
Detectives looked at the case from time to time to try to find Flora, but they were never able to find any tips. On September 15, 2017, a New York State Police investigator told the Sullivan County Sheriff's Office that unidentified skeletal parts had been found in southern Orange County. The woman whose body had been dumped had some of the same general traits as Flora, and the detective hoped that DNA from any live relatives could help identify her. Instead, the detectives found that someone in Massachusetts was using Flora's social security number. Detectives used the social security number to find a place in Lowell, Massachusetts, that helps older people live on their own. Staff at the center confirmed that the number belonged to Flora Harris, who had been there since 2001. Investigators chose to talk to Flora, who is 78 years old. When they got there, they found that she has dementia and can't say more than one or two words at a time. She did know that her room ID from the Concord was hers. Officials were able to look through Flora's medical records and find out that she had been in a care home in New Hampshire and at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital in Manhattan about 30 years ago. Because of her illness, it is still not clear how, why, or where she went after she left Monticello in 1975. Authorities have been frustrated because they haven't been able to find any live relatives. Flora said, me, when she was shown a picture of herself when she was younger. When she was shown a picture of her husband, Robert, she said, Robert. This helped investigators prove that Flora Stevens and Flora Harris are the same person. He died before he could find out what happened to his wife. Gabriel Nagy Gabriel Nagy, along with his wife Pamela, son Stephen, and daughter Jennifer, resided in Sydney, Australia. When Gabriel was a young boy, he moved to Australia with his parents. He loved living there. He was a loving father, and his family admired him and couldn't think of anything that could ever come between them. But something bad did happen. Gabriel worked as a shop fitter, which meant that he helped businesses build stores all over the city. He wanted to be an accountant, though, so he went to school to get there. On January 21, 1987, Gabriel had to do some things in the city. He told his wife Pamela that he would be home for lunch by calling her. Pamela cooked food for her husband and waited for him to come home, but he never did. She waited until she got a call that would change the rest of her life. Gabriel's burned-out car was found on the side of the road by the cops. No trace of him could be found. Pamela and her two kids started putting up flyers all over Sydney for the lost person. Someone must have heard what happened to Gabriel after the car crash. Sad to say, no one knew. Two weeks after Gabriel went missing, the police found out that he took money out of a bank in the city of Newcastle, which is about 100 miles from Sydney. This new piece of information gave Gabriel's family hope and they thought it would help them find Gabriel. But the lead led nowhere, and the case was closed for the next 20 years. Georgia Robinson was an experienced senior constable. She told herself she would figure out what was going on. In 2012, on her last try to find Gabriel, she did just that. She was looking through some files when she saw something that caught her eye. The Australian Medicare system showed that a person named Gabriel Nagy had eye surgery not long ago. The records also showed that the man went by the name Ron Saunders. Officer Robinson called this man. He told her that he did not remember much about the last 20 years of his life because he was homeless and moved from city to city. That was the case until a preacher named Barry Hale met Gabriel. Gabriel was hired by the minister to take care of the church. His name is Ron Saunders because he saw a sign for Saunders Beach in Queensland, Australia, while he was just walking around. Robinson flew to Gabriel's home and showed him pictures of his family. As time went on, Gabriel started to remember more and more. Gabriel's head was hurt badly in the car accident. He went into a state of confusion that made him forget everything about his life. Gabriel said that what was happening was not real. He still did not remember everything about his family. He promised to stay in touch, but he just could not go back to living with them. Carlina White
Carlina Renee White was born in New York City on July 16, 1987. Her parents are Joy White and Carl Tyson. When Carlina was 19 days old, her parents took her to the hospital because she had a fever. They were reassured by a woman dressed as a nurse, but she was not actually working there. Her name was Ann Petway, and she thought she could steal a baby by pretending to be a nurse. When Carlina's parents brought her to the hospital in the morning, Petway took off her Roman four line and took her away. There was video security in the hospital, but it was not working at the time, so Joy White and Carl Tyson were the only ones who could describe the woman. A guard said that a woman who fits the description left the hospital at 3.30 a.m., but there was no baby in sight so the baby could have been hidden. When Carlina White was taken from a New York hospital, it was the first time that anyone knew of Carlina was raised in Bridgeport, Connecticut, by Petway under the name Nedra Natty Nance. About 45 miles away was where her parents lived. Carlina went to Thomas Hooker School and then Warren Harding High School, where she got her diploma. Petway and Carlina went to Atlanta, Georgia, sometime after that. In her teens, Carlina began to think that Petway was her real mother because she couldn't show her a birth certificate. Carlina was pregnant in 2005 and asked Petway for the birth certificate so she could get health insurance. Petway then got a fake birth certificate from Connecticut. When Carlina tried to use it, the people in charge told her it was fake. Petway finally told Carlina that she was her real mother when she was confronted by her. After it was proven that Nedra Nance was really Carlina White, the FBI started looking for Ann Petway. On the morning of January 23, 2011, Petway went to the FBI office in Bridgeport and turned herself in. Petway admitted to federal agents that she had taken Carlina because she was stressed about whether or not she would ever be able to have children after having several miscarriages. Ann Petway, who is 50 years old, got 12 years in jail on July 30, 2012. The judge said she was selfish and gave a couple the worst fear that a parent could have. Petway did her time at the Federal Correctional Institution Aliceville in Alabama until April 14, 2021, when she was freed. Not everything went well when Carlina saw her parents again. Money, the fact that Carlina still wanted to be called Nedra, and her feelings for Ann Petway all caused problems. But the last public updates show that Carlina seems to have made peace with her folks and that everyone is now getting along. Nguyen Thai Van In 1992, 16-year-old Nguyen Thai Van was a student in Hanoi, Vietnam. Nguyen was very pretty and a lot of boys liked her. She could not focus on her schoolwork so she spent most of her time with her friends. One night, Nguyen got home after curfew and her mother would not let her in. That night, Nguyen disappeared. Her mother, Vyuta, felt very bad about what she did. Now, I do not think it is so bad. When Nguyen and her friends were kicked out of their home, they went to a singing bar where they met a woman named Tan. Tan took Nguyen and her friends to a bar near the border of China and Vietnam where they drank all night and sang songs. When Nguyen woke up the next morning, she and her friends were being held as prisoners in a house in China. She begged a Vietnamese driver who worked at a farm close to her house to help her. After she told him everything, the driver came up with the idea to hide her by putting her in a cage with pigs in the back of his truck. Before taking a taxi, they drove for 70 miles. They went another hundred miles until they reached the border between Vietnam and China. After saying goodbye to the cab driver, Nguyen and the truck driver continued on their way to the border for another three months. At the border, they met a cab driver who, since they had no money, took them across the border for free. Nguyen was afraid that her family had died when she got to Vietnam. It had been 21 years since she was last seen. But the truck driver told Nguyen, if your parents died and your family doesn't accept you, you can come back and live with me. With that promise, Nguyen went to find her family. She asked a lot of people for help because Hanoi had changed a lot since she had last been there. Surprisingly, her own uncle was the sixth person she asked. Before Nguyen told him she was Miss Ha's daughter, they did recognize each other. 
Her uncle dropped a bunch of vegetables he was holding and ran to his sister's house. She didn't believe him at first, though, until she saw her long-lost daughter for herself. Data from Vietnam's Ministry of Public Security show that there have been over 3,000 cases of human trafficking since 2010. Most of the victims were women and children from poor and rural areas. Most of them were sold to men in China, Malaysia, and South Korea who wanted wives or just wanted to have children. Between July and December 2018, China worked with Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam to save more than 1,100 women who had been kidnapped into the country. Petra Pasica She was 24 years old and studying computer science at Germany's Braunschweig University. She went to the doctor on July 26, 1984, and then went to a store to buy a printer cartridge for her younger brother Carson's birthday. Petra also asked Misha, her next-door friend, to take care of her plants while she was gone. She had planned to go to Wolfsburg to see her folks for the holidays. Petra told her parents how excited she was to spend the holidays with them, finish her schoolwork, and take care of her younger brother. Her family was looking forward to Petra coming home, but she never did. At first, they thought she had stayed longer at the university, but there was no sign of her there. When she didn't show up to Carson's birthday party two days later, her parents said she was lost. The cops then started a huge search. Her absence was also talked about on TV, but no clues were found. The cops didn't have much to go on, so the case went cold. In 1985, a 19-year-old apprentice carpenter named Gunter K. admitted to killing Petra and a 14-year-old girl. But the cops didn't believe him, and they found that he had nothing to do with Petra going missing. In September 2015, 31 years after Petra went missing, the case was finally solved. A 55-year-old woman named Petra Schneider called the police to her apartment in Dusseldorf to report a break-in. When the police asked for her ID, she finally told them the truth. She said that she was the lost girl from 31 years ago and that she had carefully planned her escape. Even though she has been found, she does not want to talk to her family. Since she went missing, she had been living in different places in Germany under the name Petra Schneider. She did not have a visa, a driver's license, a bank account, a doctor, a dentist, or health insurance. Petra saved up 4,000 Deutsche Marks, which is about $2,000, to pay for her trip away. She tried to stay away from everyone and mostly kept to herself. If someone had not broken into her room, the case might never have been solved. Her family is in a lot of pain. Her father died a few years ago, and when her brother and mother heard the news, they were shocked and cried. The police tried to get Petra and her family back together but she is adamant that she does not want to see them again? Tell me in the comments if you think Petra should have let her family know she was safe after she ran away. Denise Balser Denise Balser, a 24-year-old woman from Raymond, New Hampshire, went missing on January 17, 1985. The only clue was a note that her husband found when he got home. It said, We have got your wife. A few days later, her pickup truck was found at Boston's Logan Airport. Her social security card, birth certificate, and credit cards were all still in the car. Authorities thought she might have been taken, but they could only find an unsigned note. Later, they thought she might have left on her own, but her close family thought something was wrong. A year after she went missing, she was charged with stealing $12,000 from the place where she worked while she was not there. That was all the information the police had, so they stopped looking into it. At that point, the FBI thought they had found her. She changed her name to Denise Jones, but she still worked as a secretary and had a new family. Denise, who is 42, was happy to see her family when they came to the door and knocked. She said that her boss wanted to kill her because she stole money from the company. She said she took more than $100,000 without permission. The charges against her were dropped because her old boss had been dead for a long time. 
Denise lived in South Carolina, the Bahamas, California, and Hawaii while she was lost. Since 1969, she has lived in Florida. Her current husband was shocked, but he said things that made sense now that did not before. Denise was always sad on Mother's Day and irritable on other holidays. No one ever heard her talk about her family. Craig Williamson Craig Williamson, who was 46, and Christine Reinhardt, who was 41, both got married for the second time on October 7, 1990, at Lake Tahoe, California. Craig and Christine were a couple. Even though they had only known each other for a month, they knew they loved each other right away. Christine said, being married to Craig is like being on a honeymoon. He is the most honest, loving, and kind person I have ever met. They bought a farm in Christine's home state of Wisconsin, Clintonville, and started fixing it up right away. They added onto the barn, put in big tanks, and started raising tilapia, an exotic and tasty African fish. Their plan was to raise fish and sell tilapia all over the country, which would be a good way to make money. Craig fixed up an old school bus so it could carry the fish. Craig left on August 28, 1993, to sell the fish in Colorado. Christine was worried about him driving because he had gotten a headache four weeks before and was still having headaches and trouble seeing. When he got to Colorado Springs, he rented a car so he could go to work meetings. The night before he went home, on August 30 at 9 p.m., he and Christine talked on the phone for the last time. Craig went missing when he was a thousand miles from his farm in Clintonville, Wisconsin. The next day, his credit cards were found at a store 675 miles south of Colorado Springs in El Paso, Texas. Two weeks later, Craig's rental car was found left in Juarez, Mexico, which is just across the border from El Paso. There were no clues about where Craig was or what had happened to him in or around the car, and there was no evidence of wrongdoing. Christine could stay at home or wait for police in faraway towns to call her back, or she could do something herself. On September 14, 1993, Christine did something. She went to Colorado Springs and put up signs saying that Craig was lost in the places where he had been. She also went to the hotel where Craig was the last time anyone saw him. A worker took her to room 112 to show her where Craig had stayed. Christine thought that someone had hurt Craig the day he went missing. She thought that because he had been hurt before, he had gotten lost and gone somewhere unknown. In Colorado, the investigation was led by Detective Robert Johnson. He took Christine to the spot where the school bus with the fish was still parked. Christine thought that Craig checked on the school bus, and then as he was walking to the rental car, someone hit him on the head. He contemplated whether he should get up or not, but refrained from seeking assistance by saying that he was hurt and needed help. Instead, he thought about the need to move forward and take action, realizing that he was supposed to go somewhere and had to find a way back. He would wander toward the bright lights of the parking lot and the interchange, and then he would wander off. For a short time, Christine and the cops could not find any useful clues in the case. Then, TV stations in Colorado and Wisconsin said that Craig had gone missing and that Christine was looking for him. A former Montana nurse came forward a few days later to talk about what she had seen. Judy Eman used to be a nurse, but now she is retired. She knew who Craig was after hearing on TV that he had gone missing. Two weeks after Craig went missing, Judy saw him on the train from Montana to Washington. A dirty-looking man got on. When the man got on the train for the first time, she remembered that two drunk people were bothering him. She saw the man looking for something as he walked down the aisle. Then he said over and over again that he had to go back to the fish. The man said that the fish were kept in a big building with big tanks and that they were not from the United States. Judy Eman used to be a nurse, so she knew there was something wrong with the man. She knew he was not crazy or drunk. Judy was sure that he had some kind of head damage because she had helped people with similar problems before. After hearing what Judy said, Christine was sure that the guy on the train was Craig. 
This is especially true because of what he said about the fish from out of state. She also thought he was going to Washington, where they first met. Christine got together everything she needed for her trip to Washington, and then she left. She also packed a bag for Craig, just in case she found him. Christine went on a six-week odyssey that took the same path as Judy Inman's train from Whitefish, Montana, to Portland, Oregon. Christine went to different places along the train route where Judy Inman and the man were taking and took photos of the train stops. On December 26, 1993, Christine met Judy Inman for the first time. She showed her photos of each train stop along the way. Judy thought that the man who looked like Craig came from Washington near the border with Oregon. She remembered the building was small and that it was a certain color. Christine thought Craig might have gotten Wishram and Washovel mixed up. During the 1980s, Craig lived in the town of Washovel. Craig's son went to Wishram and put this sign up everywhere, but he did not find any new clues. Craig could not be found, which is sad. Christine expressed her difficulty in returning to the farm in Wisconsin with nothing, describing the experience as terrible after spending six weeks searching for Craig. The place felt incredibly empty and cold, with reminders of Craig scattered everywhere. However, she vowed to never give up and pledged to continue searching for him until either death or until she finds him, whichever comes first. She acknowledged that there was no other choice but to wait, as she firmly believed that Craig was still alive and that she would eventually locate him, even though she didn't know when. The most challenging part for her was staying strong and holding on. Investigators thought Craig might have faked his disappearance because when he was last seen, his credit cards were in plain sight. They also saw that his rental car was full of beard pieces. The fact that they had been cut with scissors says that he was trying to change his look. When he went missing, he had around $2,500 in cash on him. He and Christine had also spent all of their money on the farm and borrowed an extra $400,000 to do it. Lastly, it did not look like his bus had the right tools to bring fish back from Colorado. There was no fish food, no coolers, and no tanks. On May 25, 1994, Craig disappeared, and Unsolved Mysteries talked about it. They said that he was a man who was 49 years old, stood 5 feet 10 inches tall, and weighed 190 pounds. He had gray hair and blue eyes. They also played a TV clip of Craig. The video was shot in February 1993 in Wisconsin, six months before Craig went missing. The unexpected change of events led to Craig watching the show once more, during which he recognized himself. During the month of July 1995, he was a resident of Key West, Florida. He claimed that he was robbed in Colorado Springs and that the concussion he had received one month before his disappearance made it much more difficult for him to recall what had happened. In addition to waking up in a hospital with the name Ron wrote on his medical chart, Craig did not recall too much more about the incident. He also stated that he circumnavigated the United States without a specific destination in mind until he arrived at Key West, where he found work in the diving industry. It did not take long for Craig and his ex-wife to locate Christine. It is unfortunate that he could not recall Christine or any of his family members. Christine and Craig broke up for a short while, but they reconciled after a few days. After that, they traveled to Colorado Springs in the hopes that he may recall anything while they were there. However, the excursion did not proceed exactly as expected. They came to the conclusion that they needed to pursue their individual goals, but they remained friends. Christine relocated to Wyoming in order to begin a new life, and Craig relocated to California in order to live with friends. In spite of Craig's claims that he cannot recall anything, the authorities continue to view him with suspicion and believe that he faked his absence. People believe that he skipped town in order to avoid taking care of his newly opened business and his mounting bills. Thank you and be safe.